so this morning, just want to take on and, and, and sort of launch a bit of a theme here this morning, um, and I'll get to that now, but can I start by reading Philippians 2? If you can meet me in Philippians 2, if you want to search on your Bible or app or whatever, you're welcome to do that too. So Father, we just pray your blessing upon your word. Thank you that, God, you are building your church and you are doing incredible things in a time and a season which looks demacar and wrong. We just thank you, Father, that you are not caught of God, you are not confused, but you are moving forward and we, we want to join with you. We want to expect with you the things that are to come and we want to engage in it and walk in it in jesus name and everybody said amen, amen. great stuff so philippians 2 says this therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only in my presence but also much more in my absence work out your own salvation so just want you to notice that he says work out okay so, so what does work mean it, it means that you're doing something right. So, so there's no passivity. There's no gefrekheid. Or whatever you want to call it. There is something that is actually... So in other words, there's, there's an onus on you to do something. Okay? So, so Paul is writing that. Um, work out your salvation. In other words, no one else is going to do it for you. So we received salvation by grace. By grace we are saved. When we come to Christ. Have you noticed that is but a moment in your life? Salvation means that I have eternal life. Okay, I've come to Christ. I've uh, um, given my life to Him. I have received His grace. I've forg received forgiveness of my sins. But who of you know that life doesn't stop in that moment? You know, if we could have gone to that place where you come and you say, I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> Boom! Sometimes when we baptize people, we feel like we should just keep them there a bit longer so that it's done. You know, they can just straight go to heaven because, you know, then we, we know it's done. But, it, but it, salvation doesn't work that way that we come to Christ and then suddenly we are raptured out of this world and it's over. We have to stay. And then we have scriptures that says in James 1, you know, you, you, you will face various trials. Have you noticed, and if you read that scripture, it says that trial will work in you to do something. To, to do what? To create endurance in you. To even build your faith. We have Romans 12, 1 and 2 that says you, know, you need to renew. Can you see there's a bit of a working here? There's so many scriptures in the New Testament that we see that, that salvation is not a passive thing. Yes, it's a moment, but then there is something. There's, 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 there's stuff that happens this side of heaven that that wants to challenge your faith. Want to rob you even of your salvation. Who of you have ever feel that you are not saved anymore? No, no, let's not confess now. Okay. But there's an onslaught on your salvation. On the very fact that you are born again. That you have eternal life. And sometimes we wonder. And Paul is saying, listen, I want you to work out. Whose salvation? Your own salvation. So you cannot take responsibility for the person next to you. Your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister. That's tough. That thing of choice in this side of heaven. Now, that choice. You have a choice as to how much you work at it. You have a choice on what's going to happen in your life. And what God is, uh, can do in your life. Because your choices will limit him. Or give him free reign. You see, we are so quick to say, my life is surrendered to Christ. If it is, then there should be fruit. Because Jesus said, you, sh you will know them by their fruit. So the work of salvation, there should be fruit. Okay? So he says, work out your own salvation. And then he continues, he says, with fear and trembling. Why, Paul, did you do that? Why is fear and trembling in there? That's big words. That we have to think about. You see that fear of the Lord. That walking before, before God. And that, that can I say. Deliberate shunning of all evil. And anything that comes my way. Is consistently in fear of God. You see the moment. 
I do not fear God, reverently worship Him and, and stand in awe of Him, then I will entertain sin and temptations in my own life. You see, because that, it becomes, it's always so nice. Who of you have ever encountered a sin that's not nice? They are always tailor-made to you. The devil knows you. And he's going to come for you. With the temptations that are made for you. And if I do not work out of my salvation. If I do not stand in awe and in fear and trembling before God. Consistently. Then suddenly this temptation will sometimes even sound like the Lord. And then I go like. Okay. All right. So he says, work out your own, your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Now that awesome part, where we see the involvement in God in our lives, when He comes in, He inhabits us, and He starts working with us. Can I say almost He's co-laboring with us. His heart is for you to succeed, to, to overcome, to grow, not to stay stagnant or passive or whatever you want to call it. In other words, He's building in you. He's the chief construction engineer that is engineering some incredible stuff for your life. So He works in you for what? To both to will and to work for what? For His good pleasure. Just think of that. So God gets involved in my life. For whose pleasure? <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. Whose pleasure? Yours. So, so what now? Now we have a problem. Because we are all about our pleasure. And when we submit to Him, when I stand in awe of Him, in fear and trembling, He starts working in my life for His good pleasure. He wants to do incredible things through your life, and He wants to rejoice in you. Huh? Come on, as parents, when your children do what you say they should do, then you smile. Huh? You go like, yes, my boy, kid. <laughs> But when they don't, where does the pleasure go? <laughs> okay, that's us. Okay, fortunately God does not discard of us when, when we are, <laughs> you know, when there's something wrong. He was always working in us. All right. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Now, is this humanly possible? Ne? What is up with us? Ne? We can always find a reason to moan about something. You know, someone asks you, so we, you know, maybe want to pull you into something here or get you involved, then we will do what? <laughs> can you imagine? He had the audacity to ask me to help him with the sound. What was he thinking, man? What do I know of sound? I'm going to just believe that. All right? Do all things without grumbling and disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God. So I guess if the, the conclusion here is, or the deduction then, is if there's no grumbling and disputing, then we will be blameless and innocent. So, so, so... Less grumbling and disputing. Is that not one of the big things that the Lord had with Israel? Is the the absolute ability to moan? <laughs> I always say I think I would have made an incredible Israelite. <laughs> Man, if we can moan, I will be front of the queue going for first prize. Nah, because I've learned in my life, and I'm sure you have too, that to moan is quite easy. All you have to do is just go with the flow. But it's to actually shut your trap, mouth, whatever, and, and just think about it. Be slow to speak, you know, here, here first. And then. But no, we go for gold. I mean, we're like Rambo. We loaded my mart. If we want to moan, I'm like... 
<laughs> We're taking out everything. We are going for it. And then God says, listen, I want you to be blameless and innocent children uh, of God. Without blemish. In the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Now, in the midst of what? Who thinks our world is a bit crooked and twisted currently? You know, for me personally, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the rapture, I'm, I'm like, guys, guys, can we just slow down? We were called for the crooked and, and, and wicked generation right now. God has ordained us. He's anointed us for this time. He's called us by name for now so that we can be salt and right, right here now. There's no escaping. Can we just pause game and stay and get involved and see people getting born again? And if he wants to remove us, he removes us. But until he removes us, we get on with things. You see, we were called in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud of you. That's what Paul is saying. Listen. We cannot give up. We cannot run away. We cannot depart early. I want to say to you that I believe you will die. And I hope you believe it too in the appointed season. When God decides he's done with you. If he comes to fetch his children. Great. Who wants to stay after that? I, th I think it's a good idea to stay then. Because I think we'll see the most incredible miracles. And die gloriously. I don't know. I haven't seen that film yet. <laughs> I haven't been there yet. But I've, I've wondered in the past, you know, um, if God says to me, Quibus, I choose for you to stay. Let's, let's talk about the rapture. If, if I choose to you, for you to stay after the, that and you go through the tribulation. Am I going to throw a tantrum or am I going to go, sure, Father, let's do this? <laughs> Most of us will throw the tantrum. But I want to go home. You see, God is working in us for His will to do incredible things through us. As you sit here, you are part of that brick. God has made you, He's called you, He's designed you, He's building you into His church. Living stones. I always say I only have one problem with a living stone. It can leave. Yeah. Nah? And then there's a hole in the wall. Because the living stone decided, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm now leaving. I'm doing something else. And Christ is wanting to build us in for His glorious glory. He's shaping you. He's molding you. He's working in you for His purposes. As a living stone, I guess, I need to submit and go, Father, what do you want to do through me? Or do we do the thing where you go, like, Father, I want you to do with me what you want, but I've got these plans. So, you know, I'm planning to go there, and I'm doing this, and then, and then, and then. But it's, you know, can you marry this too, please? And there's this total surrender that God is desiring from us. To just lay at his feet. Now, if God is building his church, if Jesus said that I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I always have one question is if Jesus says he's building his church and you're not, then what are you busy with? See, because I find in scripture that, that, that is, he's only busy building one, one thing. His church. The gathering of the saints. Now, the church has gone through different things. And it doesn't look the same when Paul and the guys were there. It looks a bit different now. Can we now say that we've missed it? I don't think so. Yes, in some ways, I guess the church sometimes goes on a rabbit trail of sorts. But the fact of the matter is God is still about people. God is still about living stones being built in. God is still about His glory for you and me. Now what this morning is about is that as God builds into us, 
We believe He wants to build in each one of your lives deliberately. And for that purpose, uh, last year we worked on that sign that's there, and you can put it up on the screen now as well. Um, it's what, uh, something to facilitate each one of our growth. Because when we, we sort of went on a journey and we spoke about these things and we realized that, that when you ask the question, how do you, if you lead someone to Christ, how do you take them to spiritual maturity? What is the process? What, is, what do you do with that person? Uh, few people could actually answer at least something. It's like when, think about this, you have a child. Who's, who's have children here? Can I just quickly see? Who of you, after you had children, read many books? Spoke to many people? Found a friend? Found more? Like five times? Because why? Raising a child becomes quite a mission. We were speaking, uh, we had a, we had a, um, the salt shakers had a braai last night, and we had a good care, and I always wondered, what do you speak about when you're over 50? And we ended up speaking about, um, changing nappies and, and what it did to us, you know, it was it was a rough time. You know, we're all sort of, you know, trying to get over the trauma of. Uh... <laughs> and here's the thing: when we lead people to Christ, um, I think one of the things that 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 I struggle with in the church in general is, we we are quick to, to do outreaches and so on, but we are slow to do discipleship. We, we will engage people with the gospel, but then we don't teach them everything Jesus taught us. We don't equip them, we don't train them, we don't baptize them, we don't send them, we don't walk with them. Yeah, we're not fanning into flame that which God is calling them to. And, and for this reason, we, we want to look at this. You know, now, the, the center one is the most important one, is because we want to really encounter God. If we do not meet with Jesus, if we do not sit at His throne, if we are not in His presence, then we cannot do any of the other four. Then we cannot connect, then we cannot grow, then we cannot build, and we definitely cannot go, because if we go then, then we're going on our own. So we want to encounter God. So the Sunday services is incredible. It, our desire for you is to encounter Jesus. To meet with Him so that He can transform and change and build into your life. So that when He does that, when you connect people, you are, you're doing that from that place of encountering God, from being full. When you go and you grow spiritually, it's from that place of intimacy with Him. When you build, it's from that place of, of hearing His voice. And when we go, man, it's in His power. That's what we want to do. See, we encounter God... When we encounter God, we do the lot. We do all of them. Unfortunately, and I want to say this very forsichtig, cautiously, but the church has become so much about encountering God that the others have fallen away. That the fruit of our encountering Jesus has become cheap. It's all about me and His presence and the lost is lost. You see, God is still about us encountering Him so that we can connect people, so that we can grow them, we can build. Now, this this quarter, that's this quarter. We're sort of in the, almost in the middle of the quarter already. We just start. See, I can't even track with quarters. But we want to focus a bit on the build side of things, so you can. The, the, the red one. We want to we wanna focus there. Um, and this is the reason why we've dressed like this is because we want to build what God is calling us to do. Again, we can get distracted with so many other things. But again, Jesus is about building His church. Now, we are meeting in this way, in this generation. This is the, can I say, almost cautiously the culturally relevant way to reach people, to minister to people in this generation. And we want to be found faithful to do what God is calling us to do. So, so the build section is made up of this, the different church ministries, families, young adults, youth, children, and giving. If we do that, it will allow us to build. 
effectively. Now, in the same way that we've broken this one up, for those that, that, that are not in, in Shofar or Brockenfell, each one of those have its own little section. And there's booklets there at the back if you want a pamphlet, sorry. Pamphlets at the back if you want a bit more explanation. Uh, then you can have a look at them. But, but let's quickly think. If I want to build something, I want to build something, what do I need? You need a plan. Okay, that's awesome. You need a solid foundation. You need a land. You need a plan. You need some skill. Laborers. And you need some resources. Now that is very simplified. Is that, oh my word. You need some recourses. And then get to the resources. This is when an Afrikaans guy writes English. Pas sop for it. Eh? This is gevaarlik. Yeah, you, you see, I'm so incredible, I can even fool a spell checker. <laughs> so I apologize. If my spell checker is wrong, I'll speak to him after the service. Yeah, spell correctly, <laughs> just the wrong one. I get it, okay, okay. Who of you have ever built a house from the ground up, been part of it? The, the select few. I want to tell you it's good fun. If you want to see what your marriage is made of, just do that. You know, if that or, or renovate. It's always a good thing to see how that goes. Um, there's some deep working there. But, but the thing is here is that you need a piece of land. You need to have a location. You need to be planted somewhere. And, and, and what I want to say is you need to grow where you are planted if we look at it from a church point of view. You need to grow where you are planted. You know, so often people become part of a church and then they want to go there or they want to go there. And we, we do not allow God to take the, the, have in full effect what He wants to do with us in this family. And it's sticking around, it's, 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 it's flourishing right there where God is planting you that He actually wants. You see, it's He's working in us for His good pleasure. John, uh, Joshua 1 verse 3 says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give to you. Who of you have prayed that prayer? So I want to say, own it here. If God is calling you to this family or wherever He's calling you to, take that ground. Authority. Walk in it in that which God is calling you in that family. But please flourish. Please grow where God is planting you. Psalm 2 verse 8 says to me, Ask and I will make uh, the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. From this place, we can trust God for great things. From this place, you know, He's actually given us the earth as the, His saints. Do you understand that? That we have given, been given the authority by God to occupy this land. Why are we sometimes so fearful, so apologetic in actually being here? We should own it. This is our land. My feet are here. Not just for, don't chase away the people, but please, de definitely take authority in the heavenlies. The second thing you need is a plan. And Jesus gave us this plan in Matthew 28, 9. He says, make disciples of all nations. And we're going to start here. And then make disciples of all nations. You see, we, the church can be, be a, about a lot of stuff. But it really needs to be about making disciples. About te teaching people. The stuff that Jesus taught us. Here at Shofar, our vision is to preach the whole gospel to the whole world. To reach nations and generations through disciple making, leadership development and church planting. You see, we are holding on to a vision. We are holding on to a plan. We want to do that as a local congregation. We've got a plan. We've got things that we want to achieve and do in Christ Jesus. Do you want to be part of it? Do you want to fulfill all that God is calling you to do even in that little, you know, the thing about a plan, and, and, and we, Lorette's parents, built a granny flight at our place, what's it, three, three and a half years ago. And, and the plan is quite rigid, I saw. You know, when the building inspector walks in there or the builder comes and he hits his peg, that is what gives him the measurements and the stuff to put down the foundations and everything. And it's only if you have the hand that you can build the foundations. 
And he's marking these things out. And if it's wrong, the house will be wrong. Eventually it's going to fall apart. So we need to plan. And the plan is here. We want to really preach the gospel to everybody. We want to see the world changed. Will you be part of it? You see, we want to encounter God. We want to connect people. We want to grow. We want to build and we want to go. You see, because us just staying here and getting fat is not the goal. We want to go spiritually to where God is calling us. Then the next thing you need is skills, labor. Uh, Romans 12, verse 3 to 6a says this for the, uh, oh, there's actually till 8. Uh, for the way, for, <clears throat> okay, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more like highly than he ought to think. Now that, that's a thought on its own. But think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So you have received a measure of faith. And so many times in the world, we think, you know, Yo, I want to be the guy on the stage. Or, you know, uh, Belma is such an incredible children's minister. I just want to be like her, you know. Or whatever. We start, um, uh, what do you call, comparing ourselves to one another. But, but work within your measure of faith where you are right now. And allow God to form you where you are. Don't try and be something that you are not. Have the patience for God to build stuff into you. Yeah, enjoy the journey. You know, I'm standing here today, and, and I remember when I got born again and I joined the small group for the first time. My biggest fear with a small group at that stage was is that they're going to ask me to read a scripture. Because I couldn't read. I, I, I couldn't read. I, uh, 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 and uh, literally, when I'd done reading a scripture, you did not know what was in the scripture. <laughs> I was so confused, what scripture is this? And then the people were like, what just happened? <laughs> so for me to stand where I'm standing today is a miracle. You need to understand that. That is God building stuff into me over years. So work with a measure of faith. The place that God has placed you right now, just be available. Okay, the measure of faith that God has assigned. For uh, as in one body we are many members... And the members do not all have the same function. Everybody just bump someone next to you and say, you don't have the same function as me. Nah? So stop being the same as someone else. Just fulfill your own function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ. Say gifts that differ. Nah? There's gifts that differ. So you do not have the same gifts. It's good. According to the grace given to us. Let us leave them on the side. You know, just let them marinate a bit. He uh, says you need, uh, you need to use it. The scripture about the talents. Let's not bury our gifts. That which God has given us. The thing is here, yeah, even and, and, and many of you have been in many churches, I assume. Okay, you know what's the big challenge about church as it stands is that the select few does everything. But if I read the scripture right, then if every one of us brings our gifts, get involved, then suddenly everything will just work, and we'll all be blessed. You see, when I come to give rather than just receive, it is a different atmosphere in the house see if this is your house and you come to give you will do stuff take care of stuff I always say sure I'm getting paid to do this what I'm doing but there's stuff that I do here because it's my house not because I'm getting paid it's just, it's just my house you see I don't mow the lawn at my house because my wife pays me wait we must talk about that hmm no, no, no. When the grass is long, I go into my garage, take it, like on Saturday, and for the next two hours, I mow the lawn. Absolutely hate it. But it has to be done. When the paint needs to be fixed, what do I do? I phone a friend. 
I do a church announcement. My house needs painting. Can someone be, paint the pastor's house? No, I paint my house. I hate it. <laughs> but I'll do it. Okay, so let's use them. If prophecy in proportion to, to our faith, if serving in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now just take those few little words there. Just imagine if that is just happening. If stuff is just happening. The church will flourish. Lives will be transformed. Because you are walking in your gift. You are doing what that which God has graced you with. Unique gifts with which to build. You've been given unique gifts to, to which to build up the body of Christ. You have been given unique gifts. I cannot do what you do. In the way that you do it. Because you've received a unique gift. Please release it. Resources. Your life, my life, is God's resources. Why can I say that? Because I've surrendered my life to Him. And I said, Father, here's my life. Do with it as you please. And when I surrender to Him, if He works in me for His good pleasure, I will see things happen that I've never seen before. See, but it's that surrendered life to Him. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your thoughts and your plans as a living sacrifice. Now He says to present your bodies. Just type yourself quickly. It's this thing. You take this thing somewhere. Take it and walk with it. Present your body to God as a living sacrifice. That's an easy thing to say. The problem with the sacrifice is it gets offered on a fire. Anybody have a problem with that? So when I, <laughs> I come to the Lord and I say, Father, yes, my life is a living sacrifice and he cranks up the heat and I jump off. Whoa! No, Lord! What is going on? But you said you're a sacrifice. Get back on the altar. No. I'm not doing that. That's not what I signed up for. He goes, man, come on. I want you to be a living. <laughs> you see, when I bring my life to him and I'm willing to lay it down right there, as he was willing to lay down his life on that cross, suffering everything so that we might be saved. I guess it begs the question, are we willing to suffer to see others saved? Are we, are we really willing to be a sacrifice to see others saved? So that God can spend this life any way that He wants to. Joshua 1, 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. <sighs> Currently, can I say, I would, I would imagine that... Um, you know, the, that the, the meditating is currently happening on some social media. You don't have to confess. More than it is on the Word of God. No? You can probably tell me, I've met people that I'm sure they know more of what's going on in the world than, than what they actually know about God's prophetic word or direction for their life right now. Because we got so consumed with things. So that you may be careful to do according all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Who wants good success? And prosper? Do the first part of Joshua on the eight. You see, but we sometimes think, and I do too sometimes, that I'm old enough and I'm wise enough to make my life happen. And he says, listen, just journey with me. Come closer to me and I'll show you great and incredible things. Galatians 5, 13 to 40 says, For you were called to freedom, not bondage. 
He will call to freedom brothers. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the... So Kovas, I'm saved. Now I can do what I want. Kovas, I'm saved. So I can read and think about stuff there. No, no, don't let your flesh now come back into the equation. I've died to my flesh, to my sin, to everything. I'm alive for Christ. And I think we need to be careful to not walk in that freedom in such a way that the flesh now suddenly rules. But through love, serve one another. Is that not what's supposed to happen here? That through love, we serve and love on one another. We take care of one another. We walk with one another. For the whole law is, uh, is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. We might need to work at that one. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says this. In short, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. If we cover one another in prayer, if we walk in love, man, come on. Just imagine what someone will see when they walk in here from the outside that don't know any of that. And they walk in here, they, they are loved on, that they are prayed for, that they are, oh, you know, uh, discipled, taught, equipped. Suddenly, things change. When we build, it includes every, every effort and focus to see the kingdom of God grow through the expression of the local church. That's what we've been called for. We can do lots of stuff. So let me just run th quickly through this. Um, the church ministries. Can I ask all the guys that's involved in, that's leading a church ministry at this time just to get up? Just stand. If you're leading... Uh, sound media, Bible school, in, um, let's even get the small group leaders, prayer, worship, everything. Okay. Can you go for your job? Yeah, bring your level song. Yeah. Come. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if you want to know anything from sound, media, encounters, small group, prayer, worship, everything, youth, young adults, who's leading a salt shaker? Come, Tanya, he's so for now. You're not 50 yet, but you can stand there, okay? Uh, so. Info desk. If you want to know anything, if you want to get involved, if this is, this is the people that you can speak to. Small groups where we, we take care of you, shepherd you, look after you. That's where we, the pastoral care happens, where we'll feed you if you're hungry, cry with you if you're crying. You know, listen us here today, but Nicole is standing in for worship. Um, Rochelle has awakened, ladies. Belma has got to stick your hands up, children. Stephen, in uh, Okay, I'll tell you what. There's photos on the wall. <laughs> if you want to know anything, okay, Yelika can sit by a donkey. You can sit down. But you see, when it comes to church, these are the key people that are in there at the moment that are building, and you're welcome to speak to them. When it comes to families, our heart is really to build strong families. We want to see God. Uh, 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 Make our families explode in, in what he sees as family, not what the world currently is saying a family is. Uh, young adults and students, we want to see people growing in that phase where we will raise the next generation of leaders, where we will send people into this world. You know, saints, this world has become so small that when we reach the youth, when we reach children's church, when we reach the young adults, we can have a global ministry just by sending them somewhere okay 
So, so, so that's the youth, the children. Currently, they, they, we, they need help. <laughs> okay, why is it doing that now? Okay, and then obviously, I think the last one on that that uh, building one is the giving, where we bring the full tithe into the storehouse of God, God, where we give alms and we give offerings. That's why we have the manna cupboard, where we give of our times, our talents, and our abilities where we allow God to spend this life in the way that He wants to spend it. Philippians 2 verse 13 to 16 in the message reads as following. This is the one I started with, but I just thought that I'll, I'll read you the message version. It says, better yet, redouble your efforts. Redouble your efforts. In other words, change some gears. Be energetic in your life of salvation. Okay, now that. We shouldn't, in other words, look like death warmed up. Right? We should be energetic. We should be those that when people look at us, go, wow, what is in your life? Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That, en that energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing to work at what, what will give him the most pleasure. Do everything readily and cheerfully. Not bickering, no second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalled, yeah, I don't know what that is. That word and polluted society. Sorry, just no... Wow. Okay. Uh, provide people with a glimpse of a good living and uh, of living in God. Carry the light giving message into the world so that I have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be living proof that I didn't go to all this work for nothing. Can we be the breath of fresh air in this world? As the church, as a family, and like I say, if, if God is calling you there, please, yeah, then please be that. If He's calling you and adding you to another spiritual family, please get stuck in it. But can we be those that is that breath of fresh air in the world that desperately needs it? I sincerely believe there's ministries and stuff that are sitting here today that needs to be released, but it's kept because we are not available. It's limited because other things have become more important. Can we come back to that place where we fully surrender our lives to God and say, Father, have your way in me in this next season. Now, I want to just close this off by saying this. Uh, for us to build effectively, each one of us is required to do the following, to be part of the body in every way. To work out our salvation, to build as He works in you, to build in this generation which we are called to right now, to engage and be available, and not to look back when we put our hand to the plow. Luke 9, was, uh, it's not up there, but it says, Luke 9, 62 says, as Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for, my, for the kingdom of God. Let us not get involved with the kingdom of God and then look back. And I believe a lot of what the enemy has done through this last two years is to get us to look back. Is to get us to slow down. Is to get us busy with other stuff. God is still about people. God is still about his vision. And we want to engage that. Amen? Let's stand.